Hi, welcome to Brainy Dental. In this video, we will talk about the principles of cavity preparation for cast metal inlay. All the data in this presentation has been taken from the textbook of Operative Dentistry written by me. The link of it has been given in the description box below. So let's go ahead and watch. How is inlay cavity preparation different from conventional cavity preparation? Well, if you're watching this video, that means you already know about the conventional cavity preparation. In an inlay cavity preparation, we do not pack the restorative material inside the cavity. Instead, we take impression with the wax and then we fabricate the restoration outside the mouth. So, the cavity preparation has to be designed in the manner that the impression material is placed inside the cavity, it is removed or it is replaced without compromising with the resistance or the retention form of the cavity. Therefore, we have to incorporate certain principles in our cavity design so that we can achieve this. Now, what are those principles we are going to discuss? There are four principles for inlay cavity preparation. The first one is single path of insertion for the restoration into the cavity. Second is the taper given to the walls of the cavity preparation. Third is the bevels given on the cava surface margin. Fourth is the flares that we give in the proximal box. So now we will discuss all the four in detail. Single path of insertion. I want you to look at the diagram. If this is the inlay cavity cut in a tooth and then this is the inlay. So now this particular inlay should have a single path of insertion and withdrawal from the cavity. The direction of this path is mostly in line with the main occlusal forces. So these masticatory forces will tend to seat the restoration more securely in the cavity instead of displacing it. This is the concept of single path of insertion. Next is the concept of taper. Now the preparation for cast restoration cannot be prepared with undercuts or by inverted cone burrs. Since several materials are going to be inserted and withdrawn from the preparation, therefore the opposing walls, they should either be parallel or divergent, but never convergent. Now look at the diagram. You'll observe that in the first, in the first diagram, the cavity walls, they are convergent. They are basically used for amalgam restorations, but not for an inlay. Next, these are the parallel cavity walls. We can use them for inlay. Then there is slightly divergent cavity walls. This can also be used in an inlay. And this is unequal taper. This wall and this wall, they have unequal taper. So this is also incorrect. Ideally, for maximum retention, exact parallelism between the walls should be created. But this may not be practically possible, so a slight divergence is given. Since we may not be able to produce parallelism, therefore, a slight divergence of the opposing walls intracoronally for the inlays from the pulpal floor to the occlusal surface. If you look at the diagram, you will see this is an inlay and we have divergence of the wall from the pulpal floor. This is pulpal floor to occlusal surface like this and this is about 2 to 5 degree. So slight divergence of opposing walls intracoronally for inlays from the pulpal floor to the occlusal surface and slight convergence extracoronally for crowns from the cervical margin to the occlusal surface is created. This is the concept of taper and the taper should be 2 to 5 degree from the path of insertion. Now extra coronally you can see that from there is a slight convergence from the cervical margin to the occlusal surface for a crown and the taper is 2 to 5 degrees here also in the inlay and if we check it out here even here it will be 2 to 5 degrees. This is the concept of taper. The amount of taper given, well, the factors that I'm going to discuss, they form important multiple choice questions. The first one is length of the cavity walls. Now, shorter the wall, less is the taper. And the taper can be as less as zero degree, that means approaching parallelism. 
and in case there is longer the wall more is the taper however you should note that the taper should not exceed 10 degrees the amount of the tooth surface involved more is the tooth surface involved more is the taper again the taper should not be more than 10 degrees now the reason behind this is that more complex is your cavity preparation greater will be the surface contact of the impression material with the tooth hence higher will be the force of friction developed now to compensate for this the amount of taper is increased so that the impression material can be easily pulled out next factor is the need for retention now greater is the requirement for retention less is the taper that we give the taper should be given equally in both the walls you should always remember that never give unequal taper next are the bevels bevel is defined as a surface having sloping or a slanting edge in an inlay cavity preparation we give bevel on the occlusal margin which is somewhere here and on the gingival margin which is somewhere here so now we'll discuss these bevels in detail occlusal bevel this is the occlusal bevel the depth of the bevel on the occlusal margin should be 1/4 the depth of the respective wall that means this exception is when why the bevel is required to include an enamel defect now how do we make this bevel we take a burr and we hold it in a manner that we cut the enamel like this and this cut enamel is cut in a manner that if we draw a horizontal line from the point of cutting that would make an angle of 31 35 degree with the cut enamel and what would this result in this would result in a marginal metal that means this metal of 40 degree so we want a resulting marginal metal of 40 degree and the occlusal enamel margin is 135 to 140 degree enamel gingival bevel this is the area for the gingival bevel the gingival bevel is about 0.5 to 1 mm wide now how do we make it we hold the burr in a manner that we cut the gingival margin that means here at an angle of 135 degree so if we make a horizontal line and the cut enamel would be making an angle of 135 degree with it and what would this result in this would result in a resultant marginal metal of 32 35 degree now what is the significance of this gingival bevel the significance is that the the enamel rods in the gingival area they have apical inclination you can see it here now this if this results in weakened unsupported enamel now when we give a gingival bevel like this we remove this weakened enamel and we produce strong enamel margins please note this is an important multiple choice question at the occlusal and gingival margins the cavus surface angle is 135 to 140 degree and the inlay has 30 to 40 degree marginal metal the functions of bevels the first one being they help to eliminate the cement line by bringing the inlay in direct contact with the tooth then they help to seal and protect the margins because beveling we know strengthens the marginal enamel by removing the unsupported enamel which may be present at the margins after cavity cutting also they play a major role in the retention of the inlay as this is the only area where there is direct contact between the tooth and the inlay thus it creates direct frictional forces which help in the retention of the inlay next bevels are the flexible extensions of cavity preparation because they allow inclusion of surface defects supplementary grooves etc also bevels result in a marginal metal that is easily burnishable and this happens because of the angular design of the bevel then lap sliding fit is produced at the gingival margin also the beveling at the gingival margin brings the gingival margin to a cleansable area so these are the functions of bevels we have learned that we have to bevel the occlusal and the gingival margin well there are six type of bevels that can be given the first one is a partial bevel this bevel involves only a part of enamel not more than 2/3 next is a short bevel this bevel involves the entire enamel but it does not include the dentine at all 
Then there is long bevel. This bevel involves the entire enamel and part of dentine. Then there is full bevel. This bevel involves the entire enamel and the dentine. So it is something like this extending from here till here. Next is counter bevel. Now this is used mostly when we are capping the cusps and this type of bevel is used on the facial or the lingual surface of the tooth. This bevel will have gingival inclination either facially or lingually. So this is the gingival inclination. Next is the hollow ground bevel. Now it is a bevel which is given in a concave shape and not a flat plane. It allows for more space for cast material bulk and it is given in special cases to improve the potential for retention and resistance forms. Flares. There are two type of flares. Primary flare and secondary flare which is given in a cast metal inlay. The proximal preparation of an inlay is extended into the embrasure in two planes. First is termed as the primary flare and the second is named as the secondary flare. Now if you observe the diagrams carefully, you can see it here. This is the proximal box area and here is the primary flare. That means a normal proximal extension which we give in a class 2 amalgam. And this is the transverse section. You can see it here. Now in an inlay, we give in another flare which is beyond the primary flare, something like this. This is known as the secondary flare. Now, if you observe, the entire preparation has got extended into the proximal area, from the proximal area right to the embrasure area with the help of these two flares. So, it has got extended into a self-cleansable areas. Primary flare. If you observe the diagram, you will see that in primary flare, the buckle and the lingual proximal walls, they flare outwards into their respective embrasures. And the primary flare, it has specific angulation, which is 45 degree to the dentinal wall. And primary flare is similar to that given in the proximal surfaces of class 2 amalgams. Functions, they perform functions similar to that of bevels. And they bring the proximal margins to cleansable, finishable and burnishable areas. Secondary flare is a flat plane extending peripheral to the primary flare. Now, if you look at the diagram, you will observe that the bird is moving from the lingual embrasure towards the facial direction to form the secondary flare. Now, here in this diagram, you can see that the bird is moving in this direction and it helps to form this secondary flare, which is formed after the primary flare. Now, secondary flares, they do not have fixed angulations like the primary flare. They may have different angulations, involvement and extent depending upon their function. Functions. They perform functions similar to that of bevels. They are indicated in very wide lesions extending buccolingually. And in very, also they are indicated in very broad contact areas or malpost contact areas where primary flare alone will not bring the margin to finishable and cleansable areas. For this purpose, secondary flares are given. And surface defects, decalcifications, if present, can be removed by developing a secondary flare beyond the margins of the primary flare. Well, we have completed the principles of the cavity preparation, but at this point, I would also like to discuss the secondary resistance and retention form. Skirts. They are additional retention features for in the form of thin extensions of the facial and lingual proximal margins which extend the preparation from the secondary flare around the tooth. Now if you look at the diagram you will see this is a secondary flare and this is a skirt extension. Mind you these skirts they are prepared entirely in enamel with very denti little dentine involvement. It is a very conservative method of improving both the resistance and retention of the tooth. Collar preparation now, collar preparation is not given in an inlay, it is given only in an onlay. Now, it is given on the facial or lingual surfaces or both of already reduced cusp, depending upon the resistance and the retention requirements. Now, the dimensions are 
two to three millimeter of height occlusal gingivally and eight millimeter deep shoulder. If you look at the diagram, you will observe. Now this is an only preparation. It would have ended here at this point, but we wanted additional retention and resistance form, so we extended further like this, forming a collar. And this collar, it has height of two to three millimeter occlusal gingivally, and there is a 8.8 millimeter of shoulder preparation here so your metal will rest here i hope you have followed it slot preparation slot is a mini box like preparation given in very large cavities it is prepared on the floor of the cavity close to the mesial or distal marginal ridge now if you look at the diagram you will observe this is a slot preparation its dimensions are depth is two millimeter and the width is one millimeter now this particular position of the slot is chosen so that it prevents the pulpal exposure as it is you can observe it is very far away from the pulp and it prevents the removal of dentine supporting the enamel like this particular area. Also it prevents the perforation of tooth at the base of the slot. So I hope you followed it the secondary resistance and retention features which can be given in cast metal inlays. I hope you enjoyed your lecture. Do subscribe to this channel and share it with your friends. Also check out the video on the difference between inlay and amalgam cavity preparation that is related to this topic and the latest video that I had posted on the management of deep cadis lesions. Both these topics they form important exam questions. Thank you.